So, yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're all very, very welcome. Uh, my name is David Donohue. I have a connection with this house, but I also have a connection with our guest today, uh, Filippo Grandi, who is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, as you all know. We're extremely honoured and delighted that Filippo has found time to come to Ireland, and I gather from uh, my, my colleagues that we've been putting him to great use. He has met uh, the highest authorities in the land and will be meeting some more as well. Um, and uh, it really is a great honour, Filippo, that, that you've been able to, to come. Um, there is lots to talk about and to hear about from you. So I would like, first of all, to invite Rory de Burka, who is the Director General of Irish Aid, um, to say a few introductory words. Rory. Thanks, David. I won't say much uh, because I think uh, we're going to hear some really interesting things in a minute. But by way of introduction, I just I was reflecting on the way down here that about 50 years ago, this island had the biggest single refugee movement in Europe after the Second World War, something that we forget about. And we were refugees on our own island. People came from the north and were accommodated in the south as, as what we call the Troubles broke out. And we often talk, when we talk about refugees, of, of our famine and that movement in the 19th century. But within living memory, we were a refugee people on our own island. And that spirit, I think, is one which uh, it's important to remember uh, at a time when, according to the latest statistics, around 70 million people worldwide are refugees also in large part as a result of conflict. And conflict and the failure of, of civil authorities to put in place the right kinds of structures was the driver of that refugee movement here. 50 years ago, a refugee movement which required our authorities here to respond in crisis mode. Uh, history will say whether the, the response was adequate or inadequate. The important thing is we, we were required to respond. And across the world, lots of governments, lots of people are being asked to respond uh, to these unprecedented in our era movements of millions and millions of people. And that's why, uh, as, as, uh, as Irish Aid, as, as the Government of Ireland's development programme, you know, we, working with uh, many of the organisations that are here in this room, you know, work to help address some of the, the drivers of, of refugee movements and also some of, to ameliorate some of the consequences of that. And in that, UNHCR is a critical partner, a uh, critical partner for us as a development actor, but also a critical partner for us as a state, because they have an office here too, uh, and about how we can be a country which welcomes today's refugees uh, and hopefully give people a, a new start. And in that context, we're going to hear from High Commissioner Philippe, for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, uh, who brings a lot of really important experience to this essential job that he does. Particularly, I think, his work in refugee and humanitarian uh, roles in Ramallah, which is one of the places where refugees is a byword for, for, for 70 years at this point. Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, and elsewhere. And he comes at a time when how we move forward to deal with refugees is on the international agenda. No doubt, Filippo will talk a little bit about, about that. We agreed last year a global compact uh, for refugees and for migration, and David, I know, uh, had, had a certain role in that. Um, and that provides a framework, but there's much more to be done. Uh, and as Ireland, we want to play our part in that. But enough from me. Uh, give you Filippo Grandi, the High, UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Thanks, sorry, and thanks, David. And thank you very much for hosting me here at this institute. Um, you mentioned very dramatic events of 50 years ago. Can I be very immodest and go to my little personal history? You know, 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, I was sent by my school in Italy Catholic school in Italy, to study English here in Dublin for a few weeks. You know, I went to Catholic school, so I had to study English with Irish teachers. 
And um, so I came here and, uh, uh, and spent a few weeks here in Dublin. This was exactly July 1969. And uh, it's interesting, I was reflecting on this as I landed in Dublin yesterday, that um, that first uh, experience for me to learn uh, English as a foreigner, have a foreign experience in a way, was, you can say, it's what, one of the starting points of my own international exposure and international experience. And uh, it was because I started that and I took it seriously that I can communicate with you today. I didn't speak any English then. But, you know, it was interesting because as a young boy in, in a Catholic school, like I said, you know, the prevalent, uh, that I went to a, a school where English was taught not as a foreign language, but as a main language. It was a bilingual school, a very new in Italy in those days. And like I said, the Irish component, for obvious reasons, was quite strong. And uh, that imprint, I remember, that Irish character of what we were taught, the, 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 the perspectives that already at that young age we were taught were quite significant. And over the years in my career, of course, uh, working first with NGOs and then with the UN for now 32 years, I have um, been with Irish people a lot, with a lot of Irish colleagues in the United Nations. Some are here. My director of international protection, the most important department in UNHCR, Gronny O'Hara, is here with me. Vicky Tennant uh, is from Belfast. So, I, you know, this island has given me a lot of friends, but also, of course, Irish NGOs that with whom uh, Dominic is here, Irish NGOs with whom we have worked in, in many places. I have worked in many places, Concern, Goal, and many others. Um, Irish military, uh, with whom I have had Irish peacekeepers and other military that with whom I've had uh, important e encounters. I can, you know, this list is very long. What I say is that what, uh, what has always come to me and my colleagues from this strong Irish presence, both in my, lives, in my life, in, in our professional uh, context, was a message, was a very strong message of solidarity, of generosity and openness, invariably. That makes me very happy to be back here in this capacity. This is my first uh, visit to Ireland as High Commissioner for Refugees. And I think it is very significant to reflect on that openness and sense of solidarity, which comes so instinctive, I think, to the Irish people. At a time, at a difficult time, um, where the narrative that seems to rise is the narrative of the me first, of the we first, of the our country first. I, you can just, you know which many examples I can give you of that, or maybe few, but significant ones. You know, I, I think it is important to remember that uh, solidarity at an age where Politics seems to be, in so many places, identity politics, essentially. Um, one of my predecessors uh, told me recently, as High Commissioner, told me recently, we live in an age of egoism, uh, of renewed egoism. Egoism that is fueled by some politicians, that builds on very real and, may I say, understandable, but not maybe of often understood, fears and frustrations of many people around the world, excluded from the big stream of globalization. And uh, this, um, this egoism, spontaneous or not, affects very much policies, affects legislation, affects practices around the world, and affects directly millions of people. Millions of people who bear with them a difference. <coughs>
from the mainstream, either because they're simply foreigners or because uh, they are migrants or refugees, a very frequently stigmatized category in this context. And uh, this happens, of course, at a time when war and violence combined with many other complex factors, poverty, inequality, bad governance, the climate emergency, the demographic uh, gaps, but even epidemics, when all these phenomena contribute to generate these massive flows that Rory was talking about. Uh, we at UNHCR focus, obviously, as you well imagine, on refugees and displaced people. Uh, in other words, people that flee because of war, violence, persecution, discrimination in different forms. We stick to that definition. We expand the counting to those that are not refugees but internally displaced people, people that are refugees in their own country. That's how we reach about 71 million. We stick to that definition for a very practical purpose, that if we abandon that definition, we lose the only strong legal framework that can protect at least that, those particular categories. But we have to admit, we have to admit that the challenges are even steeper than that. And let me briefly mention some of them. First of all, of those 70, 71 million, I would say easily 85 to 90 percent are people not, as is sometimes thought, in the rich countries. They are in poor countries, or they are sometimes, like in the Middle East, or now in South America, in middle-income countries. Most of the people displaced do not travel very far from their place of origin. They are either displaced in their own country, like I said, that's actually well uh, over two-thirds of that figure, or if they cross borders and they become refugees, mostly they go as refugees in the country next door, either because they cannot afford or they cannot go further, or because, and that's the majority of cases, they actually want to wait till things get better and return to their homes. This is profoundly different from the narrative of invasion, taking advantage of the welfare of rich countries, long travels that we hear so much about. The reality is different. That's where the problem is, and that those are those patterns. But it, these are difficult statistics nevertheless. 50% of the 70 million, easily 50% are children. And whilst it is true that people tend not to travel much, when they are displaced. It is also true that human mobility is an opportunity for more now than it has ever been before in history. From the technological point of view, from the practical point of view, from the economic point of view, also from the point of view of criminal networks being highly organized and offering refugees and others the means to go to other countries if they're not happy or if they wish to go elsewhere along very dangerous routes. Along, if you think of what's happening or what's happened in past years in the Bay of Bengal, in the Mediterranean, of course, towards Europe, in Mexico, along the routes that lead to the United States. Libya is perhaps the most uh, topical example of these dangerous places where refugees and others on the move get stuck. So these are people that flee from ex terribly complicated and painful situations and find themselves stuck in, situ in other conflicts and having to face other abuses because this is what is happening in many of these places. Now, of course, um, um, the there are two considerations here that are fairly obvious, but I think are important to put forward. One is that um, um, this figure, 70, 71 million, has been now steadily rising for the past five or six years. And because these are people fleeing essentially 
war and violence. Uh, this figure is for sure the symptom, the easily readable symptom of a failure to resolve conflict. And uh, I have been in this work, as I said, many decades, and I've seen all sorts of successes and failures in the political domain. But I have never seen such a consistent string of failed attempts, or no attempts sometimes, to bring peace to the, what, 50, 55 conflicts that are estimated to rage around the world, some of which are the ones provoking these refugee flows. I say this in the full knowledge that this country, this government, has made a bid to be part of the Security Council. And that's where that debate becomes both decisive, fairly dramatic, and that's where if, that, uh, if those attempts fail, um, the failure reverberates very widely around the world. I, I have the good or bad fortune, I don't know, to brief the Security Council quite frequently. Is that good? No, it's very bad. It's a very bad sign if they ask me to brief the Security Council. But what strikes me is that whenever I bring a humanitarian issue to them, because that's what I do, a refugee issue to them, when I bring a, a, you know, the elements and also the proposals for ways forward and solution, in the last couple of years, what I get back is a very discordant message, is a, is a series of contradictory responses. This is the state of making and keeping the peace today. And so I, I saw the Tishak just a few minutes ago, and I'll see the foreign minister later, and my message to them is that I can't help much with that, because we deal with the consequences of uh, failed peace, but I do hope that Ireland, just as it is, you know, just that as it has exercised this voice of solidarity so well across the international community in the past uh, decades, can bring, if it joins the Council, that voice where it is needed uh, most. The other thing that I wanted to say, and it is obvious perhaps, but is worth saying, is that yes, the people I'm referring to are refugees and displaced people, but they move along with a lot of other people that flee all the other causes that I have mentioned, and sometimes these causes are closely intertwined. If you take um, places like the Sahel, for example, in Africa, one of the most uh, uh, fragile places in the world as we speak, the Sahel is uh, crossed by crises of very different types. Some are ethnic, some are political, some are climatic, some are social and economic, and some are, and some are, and or rather, and all of them flow into population displacement of various natures. So we are in the presence of flows, we call them a bit euphemistically mixed flows, but flows of population that are more difficult to define and much more complicated to respond to. And uh, this is what we observe in Europe with people coming from Libya and across the Mediterranean. This is what we observe in the United States with people coming from Central America or in Australia with people coming from Southeast Asia. This is what we see throughout South America with the a difficult to categorize outflow of now more than four million Venezuelans fleeing what is not really a conflict, but it is not simply as it is somehow, somehow portrayed an economic crisis, but something in between. These are difficult flows to define and more important, difficult flows to, um, to address. Now, I think that uh, much as we need to be very worried about the state of the world seen from our perspective, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I think from where I sit, and not just because I had a good Catholic optimistic education, like I'm sure many of you, I, not just because of that, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that this is also in so many places and so powerfully an age of solidarity. And this I see everywhere, from
from the communities in Bangladesh that rushed to bring blankets and medicines and food to the Rohingyas in 2017 when they were fleeing Myanmar. They were the first out there to help from countless acts of solidarity in African villages for people crossing the frontier next door, from what I saw in South American communities, the incredible solidarity of people who were saying, we've gone to Venezuela to work and sometimes to seek refuge for decades. It's our turn to help our brothers and sisters. This is not rhetoric. This is real. People are sharing houses, are sharing little resources very often. So there is a lot of solidarity also there in the global south and, of course, uh, everywhere, everywhere else. And that solidarity, I like to think, David, correct me if I'm wrong, because you've been involved in this even more than me, has found in the compact an institutional expression. This is what the global compact, I was asked to tell you about that, the global compact is about, is really an attempt by states and the United Nations and others to formulate a new way to exercise solidarity collectively towards refugees and displaced people, but mostly refugees. And uh, I say, you know, I address myself to David because, as was mentioned, he had a big role. He had a big role in facilitating the famous New York Declaration in 2016 that emerged from a summit on refugees and migrants. That declaration uh, instructed my organization to help states prepare a refugee compact. There was a separate track through which a migration compact was also established. Now we have both instruments. The refugee compact in particular got a lot of support, 181 states, so the vast majority, voted in favor of the, of the compact. And the compact is an interesting instrument. It is really a new model to respond to refugee crisis. It focuses on host countries, those hosting the 85% of that population. It's not just about money, but it asks countries to improve policies to improve resettlement, burden sharing in other ways. It's not just about humanitarian responses, but it brings in strongly and for the first time systematically development actors like the World Bank, big bilateral uh, development agencies, and even the private sector and private foundations. And it's really not just about states. It's about what we call a whole of society approach. Uh, involving people to help uh, other people. And, you know, we have already applied the principles of the compacts in about 15 countries. We started actually right away after the New York Declaration, even before the compact was in place, we invented something called the Comprehensive Refugee Framework. The name is rather UN and boring, but in fact the concept is quite practical. We calculate just one piece of one figure, we calculate that through the, this comprehensive framework, we've been able to mobilize six and a half billion dollars of additional resources, not humanitarian, most of them developmental, education, employment, attention to the host community, um, focus on solutions and so forth. So it's, it's a new paradigm that is emerging in very concrete terms from, from what the compact wants, uh, wants to uh, wants to do. And the compact, if you read it, it's a fairly short document written in as friendly a language we could obtain from the consensus of states. The compact, the compact I believe, captures also the complexity of today's refugee movements, looks at the longer term, looks at the mixed causes of movement and focuses strongly, this was a very strong request from poorer host countries looks at solutions for uh, uh, refugee flows. In December, we will have a global forum for the first time at ministerial level, convened not just by me, but by also a number of uh, prominent leaders of countries that have been particularly active in this area. And at this forum, we will ask states, private sector, development organizations, financial institutions, to tell us about what has happened, which is new in the last three years, in terms of refugee responses, and to make commitments 
looking forward. And I think that this will be very important to counter the narrative that nothing can be done, that the only way to uh, address these flaws is to stop them by building walls or pushing back people in the sea or uh, 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 making agreements with countries so that people cannot seek asylum where they believe that uh, the degree of protection is higher. I want to conclude just to say that uh, I started this uh, talk by um, referring to my very limited Irish experience, to the Irish experience also of my colleagues. But um, I do believe that um, um, also at the very practical level, and this is what I've been talking with, uh, with the authorities about, quite a lot of work is being done in this country, which is very important. First of all, I am very grateful to Irish Aid, but in general to the government of Ireland for the increase in financial support to refugee operations. We shouldn't dismiss this as a small thing. It's very important, this, this situation that I have described cost money, unfortunately. And I encourage Ireland to do more. I am pleased that the discussion on resettlement that we brought also to the attention of the Taoiseach today uh, is, is growing, resettlement of cases that are particularly in need of protection solutions that cannot be found in countries of first asylum in particular. Uh, I, um, I think that in this country the discussion on how to receive people, how to treat people that seek asylum here and how to integrate them is still uh, somehow fraught with different elements. I've realized this even in my talks with the media today. But by and large, I can tell you in comparative terms, uh, the discussion here is of a good quality and the level of support that is given. Give and take things that can always be improved and we all know which ones they are. But I think that the level is good. So I think that what Ireland uh, expresses uh, in, 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 you know, in, in its uh, statements uh, publicly is also translated in very practical measures, which I hope Ireland will bring to the, uh, to the global forum. And uh, I, uh, I told Atishak earlier today that uh, I, I'm very impressed by the commitments, for example, to, to, to increase progressively the ODA uh, in terms of percentages of the, of the national income. I think that these are really the concrete signals that the leadership should give. I praised him and I praised in particular the president for the effort that the leadership here has done to avoid politicizing this discussion. And uh, because that politicization has been translated in other countries in very negative terms, in a narrative in which those same governments have become prisoners too. And I think that the fact that here, yes, there's been episodes of xenophobia, episodes of hostility, but by and large the atmosphere continues to be uh, positive is, is, is very important for Ireland, for Europe, and for the whole world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Filippo, for characteristically rich and, and wide-ranging um, perspective on, on a whole range of issues which are of deep concern to all of us. Um, we have about 20 minutes left in which to uh, have uh, some contributions from the floor, questions to Filippo, uh, comments. I would plead with, every, with everybody to keep the comments uh, and contributions as, as, as short as possible so that the maximum number of people can uh, intervene and we give it, Filippo a chance to respond to them. Please. And if you would be good enough just to in introduce yourselves. Uh, yeah, be great. Uh, uh, Ronan Tynan, a filmmaker, co-founder of Esperanza Productions and a member of the Institute. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. But first of all, I must uh, thank Rory for reminding us that, well, I interpreted you reminded us that refugees are very much like us because I've done a lot of work on Syria in the last few years. And I tell you, the one thing that has made Syria so chilling for me is that so many Syrians are just like us. And as you were speaking, I remember of a cancer specialist, a young cancer specialist, brilliant young guy, who when the peaceful uprising mm. started had to make a decision, he said, would he side with the dictator or would he side with the people? And that decision cost him a lot, as he said. Uh, he was brutally tortured, but thankfully he is now in the UK and will make a huge contribution to the NHS, though he very much wants to make a contribution to Syria. So my question to you is, and it's, I know it's a very challenging question, 
but how do refugees from Syria get back to Syria? I mean, the only solution to that crisis is for the people of Syria to go home, which is what they want to do. They cannot do that because a brutal dictatorship remains in power. And my big problem in that regard, and I'm glad I have the opportunity to ask you this question, because this question has been troubling me greatly since I saw the Human Rights Watch report, the work by Dr. Eddie Sparrow in Foreign Affairs, is why is the UN funding the Assad regime since 2012 when that agreement was signed, handing over control of humanitarian aid? This has made us all in this room complicit in those crimes against humanity. And it really, there is now, I have so much documentary evidence, there's so much research to establish that, that we can no longer dodge that question. Imagine our taxes are making us complicit. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to lay, and I know you want to share the, the opportunity to ask questions. I must have Rukban, for example. Rukban, a classic example, that camp, where the Assad regime won't let the aid we've paid for into that camp. At the moment when they retake territory, they won't allow enough aid into the areas they retake. They give that aid to their own people. In other words, they're using this aid to maintain a brutal system. And as Amnesty has described, Sednaya Prison, a human slaughterhouse, that is still in existence. And the UN is making that possible, allowing them to fund that brutality through humanitarian aid. Can we dodge that borrowed question, eh, Lauren? Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask that question. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, Dominic, please. Dominic, please. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, thank you, Filippo. And um, I'm very struck by the comments you made, and I know you were at the conference in Belfast um, on conflict and hunger, um, and I think your message resonated extremely strongly there because it was at a time when I think even the Good Friday Agreement uh, at that point was, was shaky. So the reminder, I think, to us as people of the importance of that message going out resonates just domestically as it does uh, internationally. Um, I think I, I was struck by the egoism comment and the consequences of that and how we tackle that um, and the challenges that certainly you face in, in relation to decisions that are made at the Security Council. And clearly, you know, the fact that three of the five permanent members are probably the biggest earners in relation to the arms trade does pose certain contradictions within that. But I guess my question is, is more around the massive needs that we face in the 130 million, including the 71 million displaced, uh, the resources which are inadequate uh, for the current caseload. Um, but more importantly, I suppose, is now the solutions that are being sought are very blunt. It's sanctions, it's counterterrorism, and it's militarization. So this surge of diplomacy, I think, that uh, the Secretary General has called for hasn't really been picked up by member states. And it would seem that uh, the humanitarian, the, the ability for humanitarian organizations, UN and NGOs, to operate in those kind of spaces, whether it's Libya, uh, Mali, or, or in Syria, is not part of the sanctions counterterrorism consequences. So the consequences of those, whether it's intended or unintended, are potentially devastating in terms of access, security, and the ability to deliver. Do you think within that kind of securitization agenda that the future of humanitarian principles will be retained, or is that a very large fight that we have to continue pushing for? Thanks, Johnny. I take one more, and then yes, please. Sorry, did you get my name? Okay. Um, what I want to ask about uh, is the, you know, when you were saying uh, the EU paying the foreign governments, like African governments, to stop the refugees from coming here. Uh, I don't even want to ask, I just want to make a comment that um, how can that be allowed? Because African people must refugees. For example, I'm from Zimbabwe, and I'm here because of uh, the economic sanctions in Zimbabwe. There are lots of things which are happening. For example, um, Venezuela and Zimbabwe, sometimes I look at that situation and see the, f uh, the similarities into those situations. And then uh, the, 
the Europe, uh, the Europe, uh, the EU is paying the very people who oppress us. African children are here, are drowning at sea because they are not protected by their own governments. Africa is not a poor country. They can afford uh, to take care of their citizens. For example, there is something which is forgotten, what, what has happened in Africa or what is happening. Africa has been devastated by AIDS. Lots of people have lost their parents. All these young men, which we see on young boats, they were taken care of by single parents. And then when those parents die, they, their grandmothers look after them. And when the grandmothers die, those children, they have no one, no support, nothing. And then these governments are being paid I'm from Zimbabwe, and Zimbabweans are very dedicated to education. But there is no support system for all of these orphans which were devastated by um, AIDS. So these are the issues which I think they should be taken into consideration. And we talk about root causes. Why can't we address the root causes in an honest manner? For example, when you look at Congo, kids, they are soldiers, children who are carrying guns, who's producing those guns which are carried by uh, uh, children in Africa and in uh, other places? Who is the product, uh, who, who owns those guns which are in Africa? Because most of them, they are not even produced in Africa. And then we're talking about uh, root causes which should be addressed. Let us start by being honest. We give Filippo a chance to respond to those first few questions. Filippo. I can do from here, no? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, uh, thank you for the, your initial reminder that refugees are people like us, because I think this is, uh, I wanted to speak a bit about that myself, but then the time is short, and this is very important. Um, I always also say that perhaps you know, there are people like us, but they have, who have gone through experiences that we have not gone through. So there is a difference. And I think that, to me, the most, uh, what, def what describes, not defines, but describes a refugee most is the difficult choice that he or she has to make. This is not something that, they, you see, there is a, an easy assumption, not here in this room, I'm sure, but in many other places, that the, they're driven, that people that are moving are driven by interest or greed. Maybe there is also an interest in having a better life. I think this is perfectly legitimate. But mostly refugees, refugees are people that make a choice against their wishes. And I think that the difficulty of that, that, that choice, which is really often about leaving everything behind, is, uh, is more than anything that can be described. And it is a very extreme human experience, but a human experience nevertheless. Um, that's why I, sorry, I didn't mention, but I want to mention it now. I appreciate so much that in Ireland, like in a few other countries, what is growing is a new approach to resettlement through, not only through the government, but through communities, through community sponsorship. Because this, hopefully, if it spreads, and it is spreading, in the UK, Canada has had it for a long time, now here and in other countries, New Zealand, etc. If it spreads, it can help depoliticize this whole argument of refugees and put it back in the human domain, which is where it should be, leaving aside its political dimensions, which will continue to exist. On your second point, I think it is a very complex uh, discussion. First of all, we have some issues with that Human Rights Watch report of uh, incorrect uh, reporting, but we are we are dealing with that. Uh, we, we respect very much what Human Rights Watch does in many parts of the world. We work with them. But uh, I think there is a bit of conflation between different type of assistance that have been brought in Syria, in government controlled areas, that's what you're talking about, for the past uh, few years. Most of what we do at least is essentially going through our own channels, not through government channels. However, yes, of course, we have worked there in areas controlled by the government, like we work in everywhere with the people that are in control of a certain area. The, the choice there is either to not to work in those areas or to work 
uh, with authorities whose policies we may or may not like. And here it's not for me to express any judgment there. It's simply that. And this, believe me, sir, these are not easy choices. You know, I have people in Libya dealing with militias. You know what those militias are doing. I have people in Libya that in order to access, to access uh, 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 refugees and migrants in those awful detention centers have to make deals with those militias. So every day the question is, should we continue or not continue? And I think that there it's always a somehow a calculation of whether by being there the balance is still in favor of what we can do to help these people or the balance is the opposite, that we are there, we do compromises that we don't like, and we cannot help enough the people. Then it's a time to pull back. But believe me, since I was a young field officer, a very young volunteer working in Thailand in the 80s, and I had to bring help to a group of civilians that were held hostage by the Khmer Rouge. You know what the Khmer Rouge did. They did a genocide. They were at that time refugees because they had been kicked out by the Vietnamese. I had to go, I was in my 20s, I had to go and bring food. When I was there, I said to myself, what am I doing here? Because half of this food will go to these people. So, you know, these are the most difficult dilemmas. It is unfair that political failure pushes these dilemmas to the humanitarians who then have to make life and death decisions that are very difficult. I, 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 um, that's the first point I, I wanted to make. The second point that I wanted to make is that, or the other point I wanted to make is the complex issue of the return of Syrians. It's not as simple as that. There are, Sir you said yourself, Syrians want to return. This is still what we get from most of them. Not all, maybe 75, 80% according to our statistics. Simply they don't want to, most of them don't want to return right away. But then, you know, we are a little bit more granular there. So why do you want, don't you want to return? The reasons are many. Some of them have political reasons. There's no doubt about that. I think you're referring to them. But some others have more material reasons. They have no school to send their children to. They have no uh, uh, livelihoods in their places of origin. And then, you know, there is a big discussion out there, as you know, about whether there should be reconstruction in Syria or not. And the position of many donor government is that there shouldn't be because the political process has not been satisfactory yet. Yeah, sure. But that means that there are people out there, many displaced people have returned to their homes, hundreds of thousands. And, you know, these people are left without the basics. So what we're saying is we fully appreciate the big discussion on aid or not in Syria because of the reasons that you mentioned. But we believe that where there is a humanitarian imperative, we need to look at that and meet that first and, and, and foremost. The, um, just to go uh, to quickly to the other point, uh, Dominique's question about securitization <laughs> versus mm. humanitarian, this is a big one. We're worried about that. And we actually do a quite a lot of work, you know, within the UN itself, this, people tend to see the UN quite monolithic. The UN is a big, sprawling organization with many components, including a counterterrorism or anti-terrorism component. And I think that we and a few other humanitarian components of the UN, UNICEF and uh, OCHA and others, uh, and of course the Human Rights Office, play a role there to mitigate some of the more political uh, 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 trends. And I think that that dialogue is healthy. And I think that what the Secretary General, of course he comes from being 10 years in my position, so mm -hmm. the, what the Secretary General wants is try to bring together the different strands, no matter how divisive they can be, and try to have way forwards that take into account all they mentioned. Will we get it perfect? No. But will we get at least in what we recommend as UN? This is not what states necessarily will do, but we try to chart a way forward that preserves that space. Because uh, we know that, of course, we all agree that terrorism is awful and needs to be combated and eliminated if possible. But we also need that we know that if the focus is exclusively on the security response, uh, we will not solve the problem. Now, this is the big debate we have with the United States on Central America. You know, and this is not just the Trump administration, the Obama administration as well. The response there was very much a security response. Equip Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, El Salvador with the security means to counter the gangs. 
what has this done? The gangs continue and actually have intensified their, their uh, action and most of the people flee because of that. There was very little investment in livelihoods, in equality projects, in gender, in other aspects, softer perhaps, that could have addressed some of the problems where the gangs on which the gangs prosper. So there again, you know, we see it very much. And the same in Europe, you know, all, I told the Minister of Justice and the Minister of State that was with me in a meeting of the EU recently, all the emphasis is on control. If you put all the emphasis on control, you may satisfy your public opinion for the next six months, but you won't solve the problem. After six months, it will be much worse. We need to look beyond that. And finally, um, I think the points that you raised, you know, you raised many different points. I would never promote the notion that any donor government, EU or otherwise, pays people to prevent them from seeking safety. You know, that would be contrary to my core mandate as High Commissioner for Refugees. But there is a fine line between that and investing in countries which are fragile, and you actually advocated for that, to, st to prevent people from unnecessarily moving because they seek opportunities elsewhere or they seek freedom elsewhere. So there is a very fine line of what you do to prevent those flows. You should not prevent anybody from seeking safety if he or she is in danger. That's for mm -hmm. sure. But if people move, you know, in, in 2014, 15, some of the people that moved from the Middle East, from Lebanon, from Syria itself, from Turkey, uh, moved for a variety of reasons. But essentially, in my opinion, two. One was that they started despairing of a political solution in Syria. And second, they saw that humanitarian assistance, the traditional one, was declining and there was nothing else in host countries. So they said, we need to get opportunities in Europe and elsewhere. And we've learned a lot of lessons there. And one of the lessons is that there needs to be more in, first of all, there needs to be better peacekeeping, peacemaking, sorry, that I've spoken about. But also, even when peacemaking is still happening in the countries hosting refugees, the type of investments have to change. This is what, the, that, that's what you're talking about, essentially, and that's what the compact wants to do, at least mm -hmm. for refugee responses. Yes, please. Um, you might just give your name. Okay. But it's just, uh, sorry, the anniversary of Srebrenica is today and um, the 11th of July. My t-shirt is about uh, images of young men from Le um, Syrians in Lebanon being rounded up and sent back, uh, which have been breaking on social media, and their houses are being destroyed. And um, the resettlement of European countries, of course, is scandalous from Lebanon. But it doesn't justify sending people back, a non refoulement principle being essentially broken. But today we have to reflect on the failure to protect people um, in the same way as Srebrenica wasn't protected, three million people in Idlib are being slaughtered. And um, I think we can't be ambiguous about the dangers of returning to Assad. Um, it's a highly dangerous place for returnees. And the Human Rights Watch report, I think it is incumbent on Irish um, government and Irish aid to bring over Human Rights Watch and question them on this very important report, which they did. I think it can't be dismissed. I think it has to be seriously um, 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 looked at because, for example, uh, your, your partnership with Syria Trust, I think seven million have been paid in the Human Rights Watch report that said seven million between, 7.7 .7 million through the Syria Trust, which works hand in love with Assad between 2012 and 2016. There are very serious, and your partnership with the Ministry of Interior, very serious allegations, which I would like Irish aid and, you know, to question. Thank you very much. Okay, Valerie. We, t we have time just for really one more intervention. I have to allow Filippo time to wrap up, but he he's really under great time pressure at this stage. Perhaps one more? Uh, yes. Hello. Hi, I'm Nora from Plan International, but most importantly, I'm Nora from Lebanon. So that's what I want to focus on. Um, I'm just kind of um, following up on what my colleague just said about this um, enforcement by the Lebanese. There was a decree by the Lebanese military and the government that Syrians should um, abolish the houses that they constructed themselves in the informal. Um, uh, informal camps in Lebanon, because the government is not, a, uh, is 
did not sign the 1929 Convention on Refugees, and they don't think they have the responsibility to even host Syrian refugees. Um, so there are 1.2 million um, Syrian refugees in Lebanon, and now um, most of them who are in the north are being forced to demolish their houses. So, and there has been a lot of uh, NGO kind of feedback and response, and this is not humanitarian, and this is not acceptable, especially that those refugees, they do not have anywhere to go back to. Uh, they don't have the means, they don't have anywhere else in Lebanon to be settled in or anywhere in the region. So my question is also referring to the, to the uh, Human Rights Watch report. There has also been laws in Syria that are being made by the government that are also enforcing and um, that are also banning civilians from returning to their homes and also enforcing demolishing some of their houses without any proper procedure or any proper compensation or uh, any, like any other suggestion on where they can reside. So I just would like to know your stance on that. Thank yeah, you. yeah, this is uh, an issue that we are aware of. We've been aware of uh, well before the Human Rights Watch report. And uh, during my last visit to Lebanon, of course, I've raised uh, with various ministers, with various components of the government, the fact that uh, until refugees need to stay in Lebanon because they cannot go back, it is important to continue to support them. I think it's, A, a bit unfair to say that all houses are being demolished. No, it's not all houses, but there's been instances. Actually, it's a minority, and but there's been instances which we have systematically raised. And in cases where there was a reason for this demolition, uh, we try to work with the government on alternative solution. You know, it's easy to say don't do it, but you also have to offer some alternatives to that. Uh, the government of Lebanon, surely, like many other refugee hosting government, is not party to the 1951 convention. Neither is Bangladesh, nor is Thailand, countries that have done a lot for refugees, more than others that are party to the convention, by the way. But uh, nevertheless, since uh, 2011, <coughs> The government of Lebanon, you know, sometimes under protest and uh, uh, expressing its displeasure about the situation, has nevertheless hosted <laughs> hundreds of mm -hmm. thousands of Syrians. Hundreds of thousands. Now, were they hosted in the best possible condition? I don't know. Difficult sometimes. We've tried to help the government of Lebanon. The international community has tried. Has it been enough? Surely not for a country of three, four million people hosting 1.2, as you said, million plus, not to mention the Palestinians that are, have been there since 1949. It's, it's a big burden for a country. Which other country would have a fourth of its population as refugees on its territory for such a long period of time? I'm not trying to justify destructions or uh, mistreatment of people, no. And believe me, more than you imagine, we raise this and we try to address some of the situations, but we also have to continuously remind the international community, you know, I appreciate the reminders you're putting out, let's also remind the international community that Lebanon needs support. And as the situation evolves, and it will evolve in Syria in the next few years, though for those people, and they will continue to be many, that will continue to seek and need protection outside Syria, that support has to stay, cannot be declined. There was a big upsurge of that support for host countries in 2016, the famous London conference, many pledges, many have been fulfilled, many have not. That, that um, drive to help the host countries has to continue even if some people will go back voluntarily. And please don't get me wrong. I, of course, non refoulement is one of our key principles, and we are never in favor. We can never support involuntary return. But if return happens, let me say it again, if return happens, if people, and we have had some people coming to our offices, I was in Jordan 10 days ago, people coming to our offices say, not many, but in numbers saying, I want to go back, but only if you help us go back. We have to help these people go back. Mm -hmm. This is not refuma, this is voluntary return. To ideal conditions, maybe not, but it is voluntary return. It happens in many parts of the world. It's a difficult one. And this is a moment in which we have to move along different tracks, and it's going to be difficult for some time. Thank you very much, Filippo. Can we just show our appreciation for
Thank you very much for, for coming to Ireland, for coming to the Institute, uh, for giving us a fantastic presentation on the challenges that uh, UNHCR is facing, uh, and indeed on fielding these very, very interesting and thought-provoking questions just now. I know that you have to go and see the Taunus to Simon Coveney. If colleagues are good enough to allow the High Commissioner to leave first, uh, and uh, we look forward to you.